Uh, Dan Feinberg with Hitfix. Um, could you talk a little bit about sort of what the different takeaway is for viewers who are fans of the franchise versus total neophytes? Because much has been made about how this is a, a Stargate that you don't need to have watched other Stargates to watch. Um, well, going Frank, back to really. Twitter, uh, yeah, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I think what's so wonderful is that for me it is like internet theater and you get immediate response from fans and it's so um, satisfying when you get die hard what they call the true blue Stargate fans and, uh, and they were resistant to wanting to like the show and when I get the response that they are they're loving it they they're enjoying um, you know the new Stargate that that is uh, that you know that that's all I need to to be satisfied. Anyone else? With what uh, their fans' responses are? Well, you know, I mean, I think my family. I hate to bring it back to personal stuff. My family is a good example. The first thing they asked me when I got cast was, "Do we need to go rent all of SU One and all of Atlantis?" And I was like, please do. If, it, to me, it's like kind of an Easter egg thing. If you're a fan before, there's so much in the show for you to really enjoy and really pick up on and experience as a fan. But if you're watching it for the first time, we won't lose you. You know, uh, I kind of love being that character who's new to the show to kind of be the fan who's never seen it. So if, you know, to quote Air Part 1 and 2, if we're talking about, let's say, the Lucian Alliance, then someone has to tell me who they are so I can help with the problem. I mean, it's, I hate to selfishly say, it goes both ways for us. You know, you can be a fan and follow the ride just as much as a new person. And I know it was really important for Brad and Robert to not just have this be chapter three. And um, I think David Blue's character, uh, Eli, is a really great addition to this. And in fact, this whole, what's great about the show is that these aren't, as, we, as they say, the people that are supposed to be here. So there's a lot, everything that is new for them as it is for the audience. So they're all trying to figure it out. It isn't like there's a lot of jargon. And when you have jargon, Someone's always there to say, "What the hell are you talking about?" And I think that's that was a very deliberate choice. And it, and yet, for the view, for the fan, the voice, Robert and Brad's voice, and obviously their their writer, uh, their writing team, comes through. So there's a lot to love as a Stargate fan, in terms of a team, in terms of of the camaraderie and the humor. And yet, it has a whole new uh, reinvention that you don't need to know anything else to enjoy. Brad, could you talk about that sort of how how inside baseball you can be within the Stargate franchise, and how much you want to make sure that you can use David's character to let in people who don't know otherwise? I honestly, I, I feel that um, that the show is very accessible to a new viewer, and I and I love the Easter egg uh, comparison because for those people who have been fans of the show. Uh, we are very true to the canon. We, because it's the same bunch of guys and, and, and people who've been making the show, directors, writers, for, for many, many years, we don't, or we take very great care not to contradict ourselves in, in terms of what the Stargate world uh, is all about. Stargate world's a game. Stargate universe can't use that either. Stargate is all about. Um, my, my feeling is uh, that people like when they like something, uh, when they love something, they, they want it to last forever. People, I got letters from people saying, why did you have to stop Stargate SG-1 after 10 seasons? It had so much, so, so much further to go. And 10 seasons is a long time. And, and, and I truly believe that, um, that the static, being static, uh, not evolving, it, it can be death, can lead to death of a franchise. And I think we've seen examples of that in other shows that tried to kind of do the same uh, model, and and so, are we trying to have our cake and eat it too, to a certain extent? Absolutely. But part of that just comes from the fact that we are who we are. You know, we write the show. We have our sensibilities, as Mark pointed out. We have a sense of humor that we can't help ourselves imbuing in, in the characters in the show. Um, and and at the very time, at the very same time, we're very mindful of trying to make the the visual changes, the the, the more character driven. Uh, Storylines, uh, as as opposed to what we've uh, done before, so it, it we're trying to we're trying to move forward and at the same time be mindful and respectful of the fans that that have brought us to this point. And I know it's a tall order. All I can tell you is, if you watch the show, I think we've succeeded. Okay, we're going to move over here now. Questions, guys? Yes. 
Um, I'm Christina. I write for uh, PinkRayGun.com, and this is a question for Lou Diamond Phillips. Of course I get the Pink Ray Gun question. <laughs> you do. <laughs> and this is from my editor, Lisa Ferry, and she says, Any scars from the rat biting incident in I'm a Celebrity, get me out of here, and any opportunity to integrate your status as king of the jungle, and if so, how? Um, yes, uh, there's the one that took five stitches, and if you look closely, there uh, uh, are the other teeth marks uh, yeah, that are there. Uh, very proud to say that, that Brad and Robert and the rest of the writers are doing their best to scar me on SGU. Yeah. Uh, it seems like, yeah, yeah, every time I show up on the ship, I get my ass kicked. Um, which is odd, since I'm the tallest person in the cast, but um, I think, uh, I, yeah, I know, I think coming up, Ming Na's gonna kick my ass, which will be great. Uh, she, you know, she, I'll do it right now. She was no. Mulan, you know, but... <laughs> You know, I mean, uh, yeah, I was king of the jungle, I was king of Siam, I've been the king of England, and, you know, uh, I think I'm going to start, you know, working on queens next, you know. I mean, pink ray guns and whatnot, why not? Thank you. You're welcome. Question? Well, all right, moving back over here. Do you have a question? Mike Simpson with uh, Cinema Spy. Um, it's always a little difficult to, to tell the mood of a show and sort of the style and the feel of the show just from watching the first episode. So I was wondering if uh, you could say sort of how typical of the way the show develops that, um, that the first episode, the premiere episode is. <laughs> Bueller. Uh, we, I, I can safely say we maintain uh, and build upon the visual style that we started with in the pilot. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's something, it was something of a gear change for us, and, and in fact, I think um, we've just gotten better at it. Uh, we found new shots. I mean, when you're di just exploring a set and discovering a new, uh, a new set, you, you go, oh man, when you find a great new angle or a great new way of shooting a, a sequence in a set that you've been 18 episodes in, uh, that's an exciting thing. And I, you know, I tell folks, guys, get used to it. You know, we've been in, in shooting uh, episode 160 and still found new things, so it can happen. Uh, I, I think I can safely say that um, that the look, the feel, the sense of um, scope, and and in fact, uh, frankly, the the uh, the look of expense that we started in the pilot continues on. We 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 spent a lot of money on this show. Um, Rob did an episode. Uh, Rob, Rob, Robert would be here. I mean, let me just say this: Robert would be here, except he's got a cast about up to here on his on his uh, on his leg, and he has a difficult time uh, walking around. He can't at all, actually. But um, uh, but he sends his regards. And uh, but he did an episode, uh, an episode seven, for example, that was enormous. I mean, just huge in terms of what we tried to pull off. Uh, we did an episode called Light. I don't want to tell too many things about it, but we, it, it looks like a feature in terms of uh, the scope of the visual effects. And, 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 and we did an episode called Water, which is, I think, the sixth episode, six hour up, that, uh, that has whole CG environments uh, on an alien planet, uh, frozen waterfalls and frozen lakes. I mean, it looks unbelievable. So uh, in many ways, uh, we, we build even beyond where we started in terms of the scope. It's also it's also worth noting we keep calling the pilot. There really it wasn't a pilot. It was a two-hour premiere, and they and as opposed to a pilot where you may dump a whole lot of money into the pilot and then you get to the episodes and it's not quite the same economics. They've had the continuity of the two-hour or I guess really more three-hour um, episode uh, premiere that kicked it off, but really then were able to flow right into the episode. So it wasn't like all these sets had to be torn down and then rebuilt and and we had to wait, and I think that helped you as well to find that, that um, continuing quality. No, you're absolutely right. It, it really, really helps knowing you've got, you're going into 20, uh, and, and you can allocate resources along the way instead of having to play the, the pilot waiting game. It's, it, and thanks to you for that. Well, it's not <laughs> <laughs> it's a day. I'm gonna gamble on this thing called Stargate. <laughs>